Gold, reading by Thomas Holliday, chapter 1, part 3. He thought about his friendship with Father Sweeney. John didn't believe in prayers or in anything spiritual. He was a man of facts and came to Mass only because Father Tom was one of his clients. The priest had let John draw up a will. Not that he had much of an estate. The work had been a gift, the old man trying to help him. He returned the favor by coming to church. It was that simple. With his tanned face and broad shoulders, John might have been mistaken for one of the young farmers working the fields near River Sunday, rather than a lawyer who spent his time in courtrooms away from the sun. Perhaps this was because he also had a farm background. He was 29 years old and swarthy from growing up on a family farm that needed constant hard outdoor work to get by. He had attended church this morning dressed in a blue pastel polo shirt and khaki shorts, like many of the other men in the congregation. Yet he was overdue for a trim of his full black hair. He had a slight stoop to his shoulders, more from worry than being out of shape. He was caused by several tough years trying to make a living in an agricultural law practice among poor farmers. He spent much of his time trying to get his clients to pay old invoices. At the same time, his own creditors were becoming more insistent, even ringing late in the evening at the rented house trailer where he lived. He had made the decision only days ago to change his life. He thought of the heavy metal harvest barrels filled with fresh produce he had carried when he was younger. He felt as though one had been lifted from his shoulders. He was quitting, leaving River Sunday. He was through being an impoverished hero, helping small farmers fight the corporations who were after their family land. In a few days, he was going back to Baltimore to work for a famous and successful law firm. He was planning to make a lot of money and start being rich, like his other law school friends. The old priest's dog, a reddish-brown Chesapeake Bay Retriever, padded along beside him. The dog had been fed by the priest for as long as John had been coming to the church, but oddly the animal had never lived inside the parish hall. Instead he sat often at the entrance to the church or followed one of the parishioners home after services. Many mornings he would sit in John's office. Sometimes the dog would even be reported far out in the countryside, often on joint jaunt. John stopped and reached down. The dog looked up at him. He rubbed the rough hair of the dog's neck. John wondered if the animal realized Father Tom might be dead. The dog's expression was the same as always, interested and excited, but not particularly sad or depressed. John thought that most animals had a sense about things of human life and death, and suspected that Chesapeake's, known for their particular cunning and resourcefulness, would know if any animal did. John's law office was several blocks from the church. The building was very old, and it had been a seaman's tavern during the 17th century. River Sunday had been a trading post and a hideout for renegade ships and pirate crews hiding from Spanish and British patrols. His office consisted of two rooms, one in front for his secretary and one in back for him with a door that could be closed for client privacy. In the ancient oak paneling behind his desk were several very old bullet holes made by large bore guns and irregularly spaced across the brown wood, some lower but most at chest height. According to legend, Pirates fighting over women had put the holes there. His degree from the University of Maryland Law School, its frame polished and new, hung near one of the bullet holes, the glass shiny and out of place against the worn office furniture. It stood for years of hard work, student jobs, and much research and study in agricultural as well as regular law. 
More than an hour passed while he figured out where his secretary, Whimsy, had put the old priest's file. He went through the cabinets in her room and finally found the folder of documents among a pile of title research he had been doing for various local real estate brokers. Whimsy was a large black woman with ten small children, some or, or all who might be playing with toys at the little table by the door when she was working. Her personality was mothering and helpful, and she was his resident expert on any of the people of the town, whether they were white, black, or Hispanic, rich or poor. Most important to his fledgling law practice, she didn't require a high salary. Unfortunately, she wasn't very organized. He heard a knock on the antique wooden office door to the street, and it opened. John, I've got to talk to you, said Father Philip Spare, moving quickly into the room and coming to his desk. He was a few years older than John, bearded, dressed in his usual attire, white collar with baggy black shirt tucked loosely into his jeans, his feet bare, and sandals.